Apart from you, Jesus, I can't do anything good. I'm desperate for you. I can't get to the water by myself. I can't heal myself. I can't do it myself. It is necessary for us in humility to say, I can't make it by myself. Now, as the, the kind of older sister in the house, I'm 53, and so um, Chris encouraged me to bring kind of an older sister word. And this is hard for me because I love y'all. I just love you so much. And so I really vacillated as to whether or not to bring this word to you this morning because it's a hard word. I mean, y'all don't hear this very often. So I thought, how can I, how can I just imply this word? without saying this word. And I, I came up with a way to do it. I'm just going to imply it so it won't wound you too deeply. The word is schmenopause. And I'm bringing y'all that word because I'm in that season. And in this season, I have gotten a new spiritual gift. It's called projectile perspiration. And And so I felt compelled to bring it because y'all are going to get wet right up in here. This is going to be Sea World is what this is going to be. But I I needed to tell you that's where I am this season because three weeks ago, I woke up really early uh, in a pool of my own making. And I thought, this is nasty. And so I'm going to go ahead and get up. And I thought, I'll go to the kitchen and I'm going to get some really, really hot coffee. Because I thought maybe it'll be like a sauna and it'll trick my body into thinking that it's, it's not on fire. And so I went into the pantry and I thought I had a whole bag of beans. I don't know if y'all grieve when you grab the bag and realize it's really light. But there were just like a few little beans in the bottom of the bag. And I was like, oh, good night. I thought, I can't believe this. There, there's barely enough here for one cup and not one of those soup mug cups either, but you know, like a a regular cup like we used to have. And so I thought I'm going to take these beans and I'm going to actually really make them last. I'm going to French press them. How many of y'all French press your beans? Okay, you're single because it takes 45 minutes. Um, But I French press my beans and it made just enough for this like small cup of super hot coffee. And I thought, okay, I'm going to walk over here. I'm going to go to the kitchen island, and I'm going to sit down with this, my only cup of coffee, and and I'm just going to savor it and maybe, like, have a quiet time and fast. And and so I I went to sit down at the kitchen table, and I have leather bar stools. And because I was slippery from all the perspiration, I kind of slipped. And when I slipped, I accidentally slammed that coffee cup, and about half of it spilt all over the kitchen island. And I realized when my coffee spilled that it had covered some papers that were on the kitchen island. And I wasn't sure at first what those papers were. I knew they were ruined because they were covered with coffee. But it wasn't until I looked closer that I realized I had spilled coffee all over my baby girl's homeschool homework. Um, I am a single adoptive mom. I brought my pumpkin home from Haiti two and a half years ago. And... She's seven, her name is Missy, and she's so much cuter than your pale children, but in the throes, in the throes of, 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 of menopause, my brain went on vacation, and I thought it would be such a good idea for an old single woman to homeschool her child, and, and so I'm in the process of homeschooling, and I'm also thinking about buying a margarita machine this, this Christmas, but anyway... <laughs> I realized it was her homeschool homework. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've just ruined the lesson for today. And then just like that, I thought, I'm going to make a little executive decision this morning. And we're going to go to the mall and have a lesson on capitalism. (laughs) And y'all, I could almost promise you, I heard Holy Spirit whisper right after that, and it's okay for you to go buy Starbucks on the way. And so when Missy woke up, I told her we had this change in school plans. I got her dressed. I got me kind of halfway dressed. And we made a beeline for Starbucks. Now, I know this doesn't happen in Dallas or Arkansas or Houston, wherever y'all are from. But in Nashville, we have a ton of frustrated musicians. And um, most of them are now baristas. 
And because they thought they'd move to Nashville and get a Grammy in six months, they're very bitter about the fact that they're in the, the coffee business. And I could tell the person on the other end of the squawk box at Starbucks taking my order was angry. I could just tell he was, he was just bitter. And I thought, well, I'm gonna be Christian. You know, I'm gonna order easy and perky. And, and so I ordered apple juice for Missy. And for me, I ordered, this is my standing winter order. I get an extra hot, non-fat mocha with whip because I feel like the, the non-fat and the whip cancel each other out. And, um, and then it's almost paleo. And so I ordered my drink and I drove around you know, to the window and as soon as I saw him, I could tell he was hateful. I mean, he just had this mean expression. And then he turned to get my drink and I could see he was wearing crop pants. Now y'all, this is just me. And I've already confessed that I'm old. But in my older opinion, I think a man in crop pants, I think they've abdicated the right to condescension. I just think, I'm sorry, your pants are so cool, you're not allowed to be hateful but he hadn't gotten the memo and so he was really condescending. He goes to get my drink, he comes to the window. I'm still trying to be all Christian. I'm like smiling and being friendly. And um, he hands me my drink kind of hatefully. And when he did, you know, I went to just take the drink, smile at him and put it in my cup holder. But when I went to transfer it from the window to my cup holder, the lid that I know, that little stink pot, purposefully did not affix to my cup popped off and all of that coffee spilt, but it spilt in my lap, just right up in here, a whole half a grande. And again, I know y'all don't do this because you're propel women and you're all fired up about Jesus and you worship and I pulled a hamstring when Carrie got going, but I know y'all don't do this, but I said a word that's not in the Bible. And <laughs> I'm not gonna tell y'all what that word was because this is a revival today here at Propel, but I will tell you it, it rhymes with wit. And um, Missy, because Missy is from Haiti and English is her second language, ever since I brought her home from Haiti two and a half years ago, my baby is in the habit of when she hears a new English word, that she's not familiar with, she weaves that word into a melody because that helps her hang on to the word. And Missy's favorite song for about the last three or four months is Chris Tomlin's Good Good Father. And you know, they're just mini mirrors in a nanosecond. My precious gift from God is singing Good Good Father with the new word. In, in the melody, and y'all, just like that, I dug my pit of sin even deeper because I whirled around and I lied to my child. I went, no, no, baby, no. That's, that's not the word mama said. Mama said, you're a good, good coffee cup. So sit right here, sit right here and Y'all, by the time we pulled into Dillard's, I thought, I am the worst Christian mother in the history of time because it is not even lunch and my baby has already skipped school. She's heard an expletive and she has unwittingly participated in song piracy. Um, have y'all ever felt like, you know, I'm just not as good at this Christian thing as everybody I'm hanging with? You know, I, I don't usually wear crop pants. I don't have a Vera Bradley Bible cover. I mean, I'm just, I'm just not really doing this super, super well. Y'all, I do not want to glorify sin this morning. I'm not for a moment making light of sin. What I do want to make much of is the grace of Jesus Christ. Because I mean, every single day, something like that happens, and it reminds me that apart from Jesus, apart from the infilling of His Holy Spirit that makes me a woman propelled, apart from Him, I mean, I am a hot mess on a stick. And if y'all haven't figured out, y'all are too. I'm glad 
you're here. If you brought your Bibles, turn to John's Gospel, John chapter 5. And here's another big sister word. I have noticed, John chapter 5, I've noticed a a whole lot of y'all beauties bring the Bible. And it's okay to place like this, but I've noticed your only Bible is on your iPhone or your iPad. And y'all, I love that the Bible is on technology. Every single night we play on an Audible app on an iPad, God's Word in our house, because I figure I've made so many mistakes that day, I need God's Word to cover it. But y'all, if your only Bible has an on-off switch, I mean, that's just like a guy in short shorts. That's sad. (laughs) And so if y'all can't afford a brick and mortar book, you see one of us before you leave today because my goodness, you need a tangible Bible. You can carry your iPad with you to events like this or your iPhone in your purse with the Bible. But you, there are seasons, Beth Moore says, that are so difficult in her life that she says the only way I can sleep is with the Word of God as a tent over my face. That's how close I need to be to the promises of God. John chapter 5. This is a story about Jesus, and it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofs colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Do you want to get well? One of my best friends, her name is Eva Whittington Self, and when she was 17 years old, she was hit by a hit and run driver, and it ran her car off a bridge where it flipped into a ravine, and her spine was severed between L4 and L5, rendering her uh, paraplegic for the rest of her life. And I love Eva Whittington Self with all my heart. Like Chris, she is family to me. I love her. And I'm telling you, sometimes when I travel with Eva or I socialize with Eva, I mean, I get close to being arrested because people are just, can be so foolish and so ignorant when somebody's legs don't work. And we went to a church recently, and I I walked in behind Eva, and then because there was a ramp, I pushed her. She's very independent, but I pushed her because the ramp was steep. And a woman came up to us, and she said, I really feel like God has told me to pray for you, because if I pray for you, you'll be healed. And Eva gets this all the time. And she said, ma'am, I know Jesus can heal me physically if he wanted to. But I've been in this chair for 35 years now, and I've grown to see this chair as God's grace to me. Because apart from this chair, I wouldn't have met my husband, I wouldn't have had my two daughters. And so I totally believe God could heal my legs if he chose to. However, I'll tell you what I'd prefer for you to pray for me. My patience is actually a bigger deal than my paralysis. (laughs) And I've been being kind of short-tempered with my two daughters and my husband lately. So I would love for you to pray for me and lay hands on me, but I'd really appreciate you praying about the posture of my heart rather than the movement of my legs. And y'all, this woman got hot. This woman went, and she said, well, I believe if you had enough faith, you could get out of that chair and walk. So if I prayed for you, you'd be able to walk. But I guess you don't want to get well. And I thought, lady, you better back that bus up because I'm going to cut you. I'm going to cut you. And I was like, I'm so sure she doesn't want to get well. I'm so sure she doesn't want to stand up and hold Andrew. I'm so sure. When Abby and, and, and Audrey were born, that she didn't want to run down the room to their, their, their baby rooms whenever they cried out. I'm so sure. But my friend who lo- knows Jesus is like, you know what? He's got this. He orders the steps of my life. He orders where I roll. If he wants to heal me, he'll heal me. But even if he doesn't, yet will I praise him made me so mad 
that that woman had the audacity to say, don't you want to get well? And yet the first time I started studying this encounter of Jesus, he says almost the exact same thing. There's a guy at the sheep pool, and that's where Jews went in the first century to be healed. Rumor had it that the very finger of Jehovah stirred the waters in that sheep pool. So they believed if I go to the sheep pool and the water is stirred, it was actually stirred by the finger of God, but through the medium of underground springs. And so when the water rippled, they believed if I get in that water, when it stirs, I'll be healed. I'll be healed of leprosy or I'll be healed of of blindness or I'll be healed of paralysis. Well, for 38 years, do we have any 38-year-olds in here? I mean, that's a whole lot of life, isn't it? 38 years, almost four decades, this guy has asked somebody to either pick him up or throw them over the back of their donkey and take him to the sheep pool whereby he would crawl to the edge of a bunch of sick people in the hopes of being made well. And here comes Jesus, our Redeemer, and he sees this paralytic who's been there for 38 years, and Jesus asks what at first glance may seem to be an unkind or a less than compassionate question. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well, and I'd pose that same question to y'all today. Do you wanna get well? Do you actually wanna get better? Do you actually want to be freer? Do you actually want to have more joy, more hope, more peace? Do you want to get well? I don't know what the man's expression was in his countenance, but what he verbalized to Jesus was, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I'm going down another steps before me. In other words, somebody cuts in front of me. Somebody cuts me off. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. What this story illustrates is the necessity of neediness among God's people. It is necessary for us in humility to say, I can't make it by myself. Apart from you, Jesus, I'm not a propel woman. I mean, apart from you, I can't do anything good. I'm desperate for you. I can't get to the water by myself. I can't heal myself. I can't do it myself. Most of us in an event like this have good orthodoxy. I bet you half of you could quote a whole lot more verses than we could. You have good orthodoxy, what you know to be true of who God is, what you've memorized theologically about this book, but y'all, our orthopraxy, how we live our lives has got to flow out of our orthodoxy. If you really believe the gospel, if you really believe I can't make it by myself, then the first scaffolding of your life, the first step of leadership is humility. It's I can't do it by myself. I cannot make it by myself. I'm so sick of proud Christians I could spit. I mean, I could just spit. If I hear one more person go, well, in my opinion, I want to go, you know what? I don't stink and want your opinion. I could give two hoots about your opinion. Let me tell you whose opinion I want to live my life by. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It is Jesus. I feel like our culture says everybody's opinion matters. And I'm like, it does. It matters about as much as the newspapers I put in my dog's kennel. Let me tell you, let me tell you what paper matters. It's this holy writ, it's what Jesus says. Y'all stick a finger in John five and head backwards to Mark, Mark chapter two. Here's another story of our savior encountering sick people, only these people are sick in their heads. And as he reclined, Mark chapter 2, verse 15, and Mark is talking about Jesus here. And as he reclined at a table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, 
Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick are the ones who need a physician. I came to call the righteous. I mean, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. In other words, those of you who recognize you are desperate for me, those are the ones I'm rushing to. I'm running to the ones who go, Jesus, I need you. I need you desperately today. Now, Chris talked about going from strength to strength, and that is a biblical truism. Y'all, the only way we go from strength to strength and glory to glory is Jesus. It's the infilling of our Savior through the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you walk strong. You walk strong first by getting on your knees before Jesus. First, by saying, I cannot do this myself. These Pharisees he's talking to here, they are widely regarded as spiritual leaders. But Jesus dresses them down over and over and over again in the Gospels, and he says, you guys don't get it. You do not get it. You have dislocated your shoulders by patting yourselves on the back, but you don't get it. That is self-aggrandizement. That is not leadership. You can't lead apart from me. Spiritually speaking, great leadership grows in humility. Do you know I can connect? The greatest fruit I've gotten to see in, in my ministry, I can always connect it to my own natural weakness in God's amazing grace. Every time there's an ellipsis that I can go, you know what, I didn't do that. He allowed me to be a pipe And only because I was a clean-ish pipe in that setting did living water flow through. I was at a conference not too long ago, and this is before I brought Missy home from Haiti, and I've had baby fever for years and years and years. And because I was an idiot in my 20s and 30s, and I was very drawn to abusive men, and so God protected me from the men I was drawn to. And the few good guys I dated, God protected them from me because I've already told y'all I was a hot mess on a stick. And so God protected me. And as he began to heal me, and I'm slow to learn, so it took me probably until I was in my 40s that I started having more healthy relationships. And of course, by then my ovaries were raisins. And so I thought, you know, I have missed motherhood. And y'all, I don't for a second think our God is punitive or capricious, but there are consequences to sin. And sin is not an Old Testament subject. Sin is a new covenant position for people who have not run to Jesus. Because of my sin, the consequences were I didn't have children. And so God has restored the years the locust ate unto me, and I got to adopt this amazing kid. But prior to that, I was just jonesing to be a mama. So every time I'd go to a conference like this, I would immediately kind of connect with the women who had walked in with a baby. And that was what happened at this conference. There were only about 300 women there, and we had what I call the gripping and grinning time on Friday night before we went in for the program. And, and there was one woman in that room who had a baby. And so I made a beeline for her, and I confessed the truth. I said, I'd love to meet you, but really more so I wanted to meet your baby. And she grinned and she said, well, my name is Molly. And she said this, and she gestured down to her little guy. She said, this is Elijah. And he had been sleeping at the day I met him. Elijah was eight months old. He had been sleeping, but when he heard Molly say his name, his eyes just opened up and his head lifted up. Carrie, you know how when you say Canyon's name or he hears your voice, he'll just look up, he'll wake up. And that's what happened with Elijah. My first thought was, what a pumpkin. He's just the cutest little guy. He had a a mohawk just kind of sticking straight up of white hair. And y'all know sometimes how how Caucasian babies, no matter how much saliva the mama uses, the hair just won't (laughs) stay down. He just had this shock of white hair. And and he he looked up and I thought, what a cute kid. And my, my second thought was, I wonder if this has been a difficult season for her. Because it was very apparent that Elijah had Down syndrome. And Molly started sharing her story. I found out that she and I are exactly the same age. 
Elijah is her third child. She didn't plan on getting pregnant a third time. They already had two grown children, one in college. But she said, Lisa, my husband and I trust that God is sovereign. And we trust that he has ordered the steps of our family to include Elijah. But then she was very, very honest. And I love honest women who love Jesus. Again, I'm so tired of women who are like, no, I'm fine. I asked a woman recently if I could pray for her. And she said, oh, no, I don't need prayer. And I was like, well, you're going to after I kick you in the shins. I mean, (laughs) I'm so sure. I'm so sure we don't need prayer. Well, Molly was honest, and Molly said, it's been a hard season. She wasn't maudlin. She didn't go in on. She just said, it's been kind of tough. She said that they were struggling financially because of some of Elijah's medical conditions, ongoing medical conditions. She said she had not slept through the night in the eight months since they brought him home because Elijah also had a lot of other things that were keeping him from sleeping for long periods of time. And she said, we trust God's sovereignty but it's been a tough season. I so appreciated her honesty, her just confession of neediness. Well, then we had the conference and everything went great and you these days go by so fast. I'm telling you, nine hours is gonna pass like 90 minutes. You'll be shocked by the time we're, we're closing in worship. Well, it was the end of that conference and I was standing in the foyer of the hotel and I was talking with a group of women I had connected with when Molly came walking up and she just sheepishly asked me if I would sign a book for her. And I said, oh, Molly, I'd be delighted to. And so I start writing in her book, and y'all may have noticed, Chris was too gracious to tell you this, but I am probably a tad ADD, undiagnosed, but I am easily distracted. And so while I'm writing in Molly's book, the women I'd been talking with continued to chat. And I accidentally wrote a word they said out loud (laughs) in Molly's book in big black Sharpie. And I was like, oh, crudhead. I thought, you know, I really like her and I've gone and defaced her book. And I thought, oh, shoot. And then from seemingly out of nowhere, I remembered a verse that included the mistake word. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is like a little Snapchatty thing. You know, I can kind of do it up around there and fix it. And so I wrote the mistake verse into it in a little balloon, made it like all cute, like all so spiritual. And then um, I hugged her and she walked away. And I didn't think I'd ever see her again. I knew she lived several states away from me. But about 10 minutes later, Molly comes walking back up. I was still in the foyer, very obvious she had been crying. And she said, Lisa, when you have a second, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And she said, well, do you remember last night when I told you that we trust God's sovereignty? And I said, oh, yeah. And she said, well, I didn't tell you my whole story. She said, I I know God is sovereign. I know he's good. I know that in my head. I believe that theologically. But she said, emotionally, this season has just, it's really knocked my feet out from under me. She said, I'm just really, really struggling. And she said, the last place I wanted to be this weekend was at a Christian women's event. She said, I thought, I just, I just can't do perky. And some of y'all may have thought that. Driving toward the Verizon Center this morning, you may have thought, you know, I'm not sure I can do this because I'm just, I'm just not in a great place. She said, I told my husband I didn't want to go, but he told me he really felt like this would be good for my soul. So she said, I made a deal with my husband. I told him I would go to this Christian women's event, but I wasn't gonna go with anybody else because I just didn't have the energy for small talk. I said, I'm gonna drive by myself. And she said, on the way to this event yesterday, I was just crying out to the Lord in my car. I didn't even turn on the radio. I was just kind of praying the whole way here. And I said, God, I need a fresh reminder from you. I'm just, I'm dying this season. And I need to be reminded that you're still on the throne. I need to be reminded that you still see me because I feel invisible and I feel like my prayers are hitting the ceiling. And she said, Lisa, the the event has been fine. She said, I've really enjoyed it. But she said, a few minutes ago when I got on the elevator, I was just going up to get my suitcase to leave. She said, there are a bunch of other women on the elevator. And so it took a long time to get to my floor. And she said, because it was taking a long time and I didn't want to make small talk, I just kind of absentmindedly opened your book 
And she said, I thought, I'll just see what that lady inscribed in my book. And she said, I was shocked to see that out of all the verses you could have written in my book, the verse you wrote was the verse I chose as my life verse 20 years ago when I was in Campus Crusade in college. And she said, I stared at that verse and I thought, I can't believe this. Out of all the verses in the Bible, that's the verse she wrote in my book and it's such an obscure verse. And she said, in that moment, I sensed God through his spirit say, Molly, I am right here. I've got this. I've got you, I'm right here. I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you. I just want you to turn to me. And she said, Lisa, it was such a precious moment. It was exactly what I had prayed for, that tangible reminder. And I just had to come back and tell you, thank you. And I said, oh, Molly, it's a bigger miracle than you think. And y'all, I told her that I was not trying to be wise or spiritual sage when I wrote that in her book. I mean, straight up, y'all, my motive was to cover a mistake. That was my only motive. But by the grace of the God who loves us more than we can possibly ask or imagine, he used even my foolish distraction as a bridge to embrace this exhausted daughter of his. Y'all, our orthopraxy has got to be grounded in humility. The best propel leaders will grow out of humility, out of a, a continual cognizance of, I can't do this apart from Jesus. Jesus, I need you today. Jesus, today, apart from you, I'm going to blow it. Jesus, if I'm going to lead well, I need you to indwell. 